record this also as a backup. That way it gets us uh, just that extra little bit of contingency support. Welcome cool. to the book launch of Ken Address's book, Amber Dawn. And I will say that I am that far through the book already and absolutely enjoying it. Uh, positive. I told Sharon earlier today, we were talking about it. Uh, I kind of equate the book a bit of uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes trying to find the day of the jackal uh, <laughs> because the jackal keeps moving and Sherlock is just intuitively finding things that don't make sense. And that's kind of how I surmised it earlier today when I was talking with her. You're welcome to use any of that. <laughs> but I'll probably put it. I'll probably put that in a review for you anyway, just to have it there. Anyway, ah, uh, Ken, welcome. I am super happy to have a, the opportunity to talk to another Navy captain. Uh, I'm an aviator. You're a medical doctor. I understand your your practice uh, is in internal medicine, and you were in the Navy for 24 years, and you've had a chance to work with Navy and Marine Corps around the world. So, why don't you take it off for a few minutes and just kind of tell us a little bit about you, and then I'll start talking about your book. Okay. Uh, well, first off, Fred, I, there is one thing in your bio that caught my attention. And I have to read this thing. It said, if you treat symptoms, you always treat symptoms. You must treat the cause of a problem to correct it. And that's what I used to tell my family practice residents all the time on Naval Hospital, Pensacola. <laughs> so I said, well, this guy resonates. The uh, so uh, I appreciate you hosting the meeting. It's uh, it really should be fun. And of course, I got to give a shout out to Sharon for dragging this old warrior into the uh, 21st century of communications and, uh, and doing a podcast. It's uh, it's really been a lot of fun. The uh, you know this thing all started kind of inadvertently way back in when I was going to college at Marietta, and uh, I had no idea at the time, but it was Miss Kingsbury's required English composition class what I called the dreaded blue books. And we didn't have to go home and write these assignments. But to her great credit, she taught me how to uh, express myself in writing, which is uh, just has been invaluable. And with, I say, no idea that it ever wind up being a uh, writing a book. So, you know, my Navy career was really interesting. I, I just would, had the privilege of just serving with some incredible people. Um, and then gradually advancing to more senior staffs, uh, Seventh Fleet and uh, Nav Sent during the Desert Storm and Sink Pack Fleet, and and the the people I met were just phenomenal individuals and uh, great role models and taught me an incredible lot of stuff. And uh, so when I finally retired, I I started thinking about things, uh, and I said, you know, I'm I love to read. And so it goes way back in days in high school and I'd even, you know, drag myself through Ann Rand of all things and, uh, and did that. And then, you know, all the classics, you know, Michener, I call them all day sucker books. You know, these things were like two inches thick and I just delve into them, just love the historical novels. And, uh, and so then, then I started looking at Desert Storm when I was there, and there was just so much stuff going on in the background that never made it into a, a 30 second sound bite on the news. And the, uh, the things that we, you know, especially Amos, Maws, and Arthur, and the decisions they had to make as Navsent, and, uh, and what, went into the, what went into those. And if you made the, you know, the great, you know, the right choice, that was great. But if you made the wrong one, and, uh, and the consequences would have been just amazing. Anyway, so that was part of it. Then when I was at, at Sink Pack Fleet, I was looking at what was going on in the South China Sea and the Spratly Islands. And, uh, and this was the genesis of the first book, Flashpoint. And I said, you know, nobody has a clue where the South China Sea is. I mean, you ask somebody, said, well, it's the south of China? Well, yeah, <laughs> but it's this little body of water. It's only the size of the, of the Gulf of Mexico and all this crazy stuff going on. So I decided without any idea what I was doing to write a book. Well, <laughs> so I sort of kind of backed into this thing. And, uh, and then I got smart and I said, well, I need to actually probably go to some writers conferences. That's where I, and that's why I met uh, some really phenomenal folks. Uh, on the top of the list was Bill Bernhardt, who is the publisher 
of the, my books now. And, uh, you know, a friend and a mentor and a uh, best-selling author, uh, Jacqueline Mitchard, who her, her first book was on Ophra's, the first book that she took in her uh, book presentations. And then a guy named William Martin, he was out in Boston, and uh, and he's written a whole mess of historical novels on uh, about the like Lincoln Lincoln Letters one. Anyway, so all these folks sort of guided me. And Bill Martin uh, in a conference in Maui was one that actually gave me the idea of actually how to format uh, Amber Dawn. And uh, he said, "Well, you need to do this, 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 this." And so fortunately, I actually listened to him. And that was the genesis of all this. And then over the years, it just, you know, just one has led to another. And so now it's a, you know, a five book series in the making. Amber Dawn is number two. Um, there's a one chapter teaser of novel number three in the Defender series. And that's uh, called Arctic Menace. And that's going to be set. Uh, uh, I try to get a topical issue. And so this is about rare earth elements of all things. And how can you make a book that didn't put you to sleep on rare earth elements? But this is about my my character, Nick Parkos, uh, running against a nefarious uh, uh, Chinese spy in Georgetown. And he winds up off the coast of Alaska. And, uh, and, and so the other thing I wanted to do is um, involve the Coast Guard because there's not many books that have the Coast Guard. So I was fortunate enough to, uh, to contact the Air Force or the uh, Coast Guard liaison office in Los Angeles and do the movies and books and all this. And so they reviewed the book for accuracy. And, uh, and so that was a great assist. Um, book number four, I'm about 60% into, and that's going to be set in Prague. So uh, that's called going to be called the Curators. And so I'm keeping the came, same characters through. And the courage is interesting, in, at least for me anyway, hopefully for, the, for anybody who reads the book, it's, it's going to delve into the, uh, the background, deeply into the background of what made Nick Parkos Parkos. And then the fifth book I'm doing research on, and that's going to be set in the Indian Ocean. It's sort of going to be an Indian Ocean version of uh, Flashpoint. And uh, so we'll see where that goes. It's just some ideas percolating. And... Uh, so it, it's, been, it's been an interesting thing because when I first started running these things, I, again, I had no idea what I was really doing. And then I realized it was all about your characters. And so my characters have begun sort of my family, and if you will. So when I'm out the series, I got to say goodbye to all these people. And I think that's going to be, that's going to be kind of tough. But I've, I learned also that I, I need, when you're writing, I really wanted to treat my characters with respect. And, uh, and so when I'm reading some of these newer novels that are coming out, and they, a lot of authors just don't seem to do a really good job of that. That's not saying I do, but they're, they're sort of, they really don't get into our character's head on what they, you know, why did they do what they do? And then uh, if I can find my quote here, because it was actually on the epigraph of, um, what the heck did I do with this thing? The epigraph of the, of of Amber Dawn, and it's uh, something I found that actually I quoted in the, later on in the book, and it's by Julian Barnes, Nothing to Be Afraid Of, and it said the epigraph is, you are what you have done, what you have done is in your memory, what you remember is what defines you, and so I said, well, that's, that's a pretty cool quote, and it really sort of defines what I'm trying to do now with my characters. Um, so anyway, so that's uh, that's sort of a, a quick thumbnail of sort of how I got to where I am right now, wherever that happens to be, and uh, my train of thought. That's what gets me. So yeah, <laughs> my final thought is equally started. Yeah. Well, it's the uh, go ahead. My your final thought. Yeah, I have a uh, one final ahead, favorite we... quote. That I actually use in my retirement ceremony with my wife. She, Chris is also a retired Navy captain. So uh, thank you very much, the Navy, for paying for our house. <laughs> and uh, the quote is, is uh, where will you be when you get where you're going? Wow. And, uh, and so that's actually, it was a, a comedian said that thing, but it's really profound. And, uh, and so 
it, it kind of defines a lot of, of folks who just say, you know, what you do is not age dependent. It's sort of life dependent. And you, you just look for things to do. You keep mentally active, physically active if you can. Uh, you just take care of yourself. And uh, so it's really pretty cool. You know, so like back in my college, you know, my college taught me how to, taught me how to learn and to keep your, you know, and uh, so you can always keep looking at things around you, kind of thinking about stuff. And if it, if something is, you know, crazy as writing a book, then terrific, but it could be anything because wherever you've been, you just want to leave the, any place that you've been a little better for having been there. I asked you just before we started, and I noticed your first book was published in October of last year, just a few months ago. The second book right. is out. What kind of plan do you have for the, uh, the future books? Um, well, but Bill and I want to do, Bill Bernard, my publisher, what we'd like to do is, is put one out about every four to five months. And which is, and of course, somebody's saying, well, dang, that's just really cranking out the books. And it's interesting. We had a, uh, <laughs> an interview with the uh, Morrow, David Morrow, who is the author of uh, the Rambo series. And people say, well, you've had 40 books. You just crank out the books. We said, well, I've been writing for like 50 years. So, <laughs> you know, so for him, and like for these, I started writing the notes when I was still on active duty. And that's, it's been so long I've been retired. I can't even remember when I retired. And, uh, and so there's a lot of books, but there's a lot going into them. So I said the, the first two were complete reworks of ones I'd written earlier. Uh, say Arctic Menace is actually cooling its heels right now. It's done. And I'm going back to uh, um, kind of do some major revisions and kind of bringing up the speed of our think new things that are happening between the U.S. and China in the uh, Arctic. And then the, say number four is I'm about 60% of that. So so if you space these things out, it'll be, oh, goodness, maybe a year and a half total for the series. And then, uh, and then I may, you know, I can't say goodbye to, to Nick Parkos and the, and the rest of the characters in the books, you know, do I write a sixth? I don't know. Um, what I'd like to do is write a, an historical novel uh, based on my, my family, my namesake, Lieutenant James Andrews came over in 1635 and settled in Ipswich, Massachusetts, and on the Angel Gabriel. And that ship actually uh, got caught in the storm of the century, if you will, off the coast of Maine and sank. He managed to survive, make, made his way down to Ipswich, and became one of the founding fathers of the revolution. I mean, he was thrown in jail by Governor Andros for sedition, uh, got involved in the Pequot Indian Wars. Uh, even in the Salem witch trials, save trying to save a friend of his wife. <laughs> so he's a pretty interesting character. And so to be able to kind of get into his head without trying to put, you know, our current, you know, thinking of nowadays into a book, you know, how do you, how does a guy in 1635, how did he, why did he wind up doing what he did? And so I think when you write a book, um, it's some of what a lot of the major authors, you know, it's like uh, Stephen King. He says, you can't write for others. You need to write for yourself. And I said, you really can't chase it. You, you know, you don't want to be, you want to be the best version of yourself. You don't want to be the second best of another author. So I used to say, well, it'd be really cool. You know, it's the next Clancy. Well, uh, not necessarily. So if I see something like that, I sort of cringe because you don't want to be Clancy. You want to be your own person and tell your own story. Now, you know, whether that happens in, in the case of my books, you know, that only the future will tell that. Um, so, anyway, so there you go. <laughs> well, I noticed that you had written a nonfiction book earlier about your daughters. Uh, do you have any plans for any other nonfiction books? Uh, not yet. I Well, sort of. You know, it's interesting. At the... Um, uh, Bill Bernard, again, my publisher, wants to put together a novella of Christmas stories. So uh, he's asked me and two of his other authors to write around a 20 or 30,000 word novella. Uh, 
and he wants to bind those together and put them out and they're based on the holiday season, you know, Christmas, Hanukkah and whatever. And so I said, God, man, what am I going to do with there? So what I did is I've dragged out my letters that I sent my wife during Desert Storm. And to her great credit, she actually saved them all and I numbered them before I sent them. So I've got like 150 letters. So I pulled out the ones starting around the 9th of December and I'm going to go through those. And, uh, and so that book is, that novella is going to be sort of semi uh, autobiographical. So I'm just lifting out, you know, entire you know, pages of what I wrote my, my wife, Chris, during the war. She was in Yokosuka with the two girls. And, uh, and so she was a uh, fully active pediatrician at the Naval Hospital. So when I'm out gallivanting, you know, sitting on my can on the ship in the Gulf, she was y- Yokosuka, you know, taking call and all this. And, you know, my five and seven-year-olds at the time. So uh, that's going to be interesting. I'm not sure quite how that's going to go, but uh, it's going to go somewhere quickly because I got to have it done by August. <laughs> I noticed one thing about your writing, particularly there in Amber Dawn. Uh, it's, it's interesting in the fact that I can read and be in the mindset of Nick or in Bashir or whatever. And typically some books go really up and you're up here and then they kind of come back down. And you're in and out. Uh, I find that you have a very unique ability to keep me in, in two different minds as I'm reading through there. Uh, the, the main character, Nick, and the other character, Bashir. And the question I'm asking is, how did you achieve that? And as you're describing these places and the smells and what you see and what you hear, are these things that you actually experienced when you were in the Navy going around the world? Uh, some of the uh, some of the places, yeah. In the, so in, in France, where the uh, Al uh, Bashir sets off his uh, second dirty bomb, that's a Place de Fristenberg, and of course, you know, Rob is much better pronouncing this stuff than I am. I, I'll talk to Rob in a minute, but what he's, he's, well, I will touch on that right now. I've killed him. I've given him French. I've given him Russian. I've given him Arabic. <laughs> so he's, he's saying, like, why did I ever accept this offer? But anyway, <laughs> he's, a, he's a high school friend, but we'll get into that. <laughs> we'll talk a minute when, when, we, when, when Rob gets to, to read a chapter. But I guess part of this is like, welcome to, welcome to my brain. It's not really quite schizophrenic, but I can sort of, you know, skip around and, and, you know, us old guys wake up at two or three o'clock in the morning and you got to think about something. And so of course I don't think about work anymore, but I think about my characters and then something just pops into my head. But the, uh, so the Place de France of Burgers at once in France, uh, the whole first part of one of the chapters when, uh, when Bashir is going into Karachi, Pakistan, that was actually my experience on the on the bridge wing of the USS Truxton, my cruiser way back in the day. And we pulled into Karachi and boy, that's <laughs> the sights and smells and everything in that place are still in my head. So I just wrote that down. Um, of course, I went in when I was with Sink, uh, the physician to sink pack we went into Somalia, and of course, for the for the four star, I was actually among other things, I was his official taster. <laughs> he, he and Mrs. Longa sit at the head of the table in this big Somali warlord banquet. They'd sort of look down to me. <laughs> I'd pick up something and eat it, and I give him a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Wow. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> so anyway, so just kind of so some of that stuff sent in Somalia was kind of based on some personal experiences too, and. Uh, in one final note on that piece, a, uh, one of the former surgeon generals who's a, a friend wrote me a, a letter that was really flattering. He said, you know, Ken, I, I feel like I know some of these guys. And of course, I <laughs> the Admiral said, well, actually, sure you do. <laughs> so uh, you know, the, the key to this thing, you just, you know, kind of said, it helps being a physician. And if you listen, and uh, if you're any good, you listen to what your patients are telling you. And so a lot of the little subtleties and things are just coming up from just, you know, watching people and listen to how they interact and what they say. And again, why do they do what they do? And it's back to that quote I used earlier. So it's a... Uh, how do you really get into the mindset of a terrorist? How do you get into the mindset of a terrorist and then turn right back around and have the, res- the other perspective of a non-terrorist 
and you're, you're keeping everybody's interest. It just it yeah. seems to me to be a, I wouldn't say daunting, but certainly a. Uh, yeah. It was it was interesting on, on writing about uh, Al Bashir. Yeah, and uh, Bashir Al Kutcher is his name, and he's a the, the Czechian terrorist. And and of course, if you've if you've gone to war, you sort of if you see the face of war, then you sort of know what is kind of a visceral feeling. And so when I was thinking of my character, I said, what would set somebody off so bad? That they become a terrorist, and this this guy is really smart. He was a nuclear uh, nuclear engineer, and the uh, Russians actually were sending him off to his PhD in Paris. And so, uh, but what would set him off? And he's checking. And so, when the Russians invaded, and this is real history, of course, when the Russians invaded Chechnya, and uh, and uh, overran the capital city, their special Ops forces, actually some of the paramilitaries, actually slaughtered a whole mess of civilians. So I said, you know, I read that. And I said, if if the guy survived, his wife and daughter were killed, what would that what would that do to you? And so that led to uh, Al Kurtier. So he's really you, you want to make your, at least me, I don't want to make my my Villains all sociopaths. I mean, that comes right nowadays. And, I mean, you can make an evil person, but it, what, what you need to do is dive into their head. And why do they do that? And so Al Kutcher is uh, trying to portray him as somebody who is normal, if you will, until uh, this happened to him. And then he went off to uh, Afghanistan, joined the, uh, uh, the Muslim uh, rebels in southern Afghanistan. And, and so dealing with this anger and that's where the cover of the book came in so his little girl's favorite flower was the sunflower so when there when he was in studying in the uh, marie Pierre uh curie institute in paris uh they used to go to the south france and uh, and so one of his memories is the uh, his daughter and she loved sunflowers and so before he would set one of his bombs off he would buy a bouquet of sunflowers and so that's what the cover of the book's all about. And while I'm shifting over to Rob here in just a second, would you put the contact information or whatever you think is appropriate for people to, to contact you or to get your book or anything like that? Just can you put that in the chat? I appreciate it greatly. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll give a shout out to Sharon. Sharon! <laughs> He's already put it in once. Uh, we, will, we will do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's supposing I actually know what I'm doing with all this electronic stuff. Oh, okay. I understand. <laughs> that's a leap. Yeah, you but I'm going to get a keyboard. I can't, yeah, well, I can't spell with a flip still, but, <laughs> but, but, but we'll get some write stuff books out. The best yeah. Yes, Rob, <laughs> I was watching many, many years ago, I was traveling between Houston and Corpus, and I'm listening to a show. And these couple of people, a couple of guys were on there and they're talking about just cold calling people. And it's just, you know, the same thing that they're doing over and over again. And one day, one of the guys decided, well, today I'm going to do a British accent and then tomorrow a French accent and the next day a German accent. And all of a sudden his sales picked up tremendously because of just you know, one day you do uh, James Cagney or, or uh, oh, doesn't matter, but he would do different people. And that was just every day. OK, who am I going to be today? And that was his his way of getting 300 or 400 phone calls that he knew he was going to get a lot of no's to. But you know, when people say no to somebody who's speaking English, that's one thing. You get somebody on there and they're speaking, you know, maybe a little French, a little Russian, or what. It's different, and you kind of listen a little bit more than just click. And uh, but I, I'm assuming because of the different languages that are in the in the book that you have a little bit of ability to to cover some of those. So. I'm going to let you introduce yourself and talk just a little bit about who the real Rob is and what does he really love to do. Uh, thanks, Red. And uh, it's really, really cool to be here as part of this thing, Ken. And, when, uh, and I want to say hello to uh, some of my friends out there, including uh, a very, very talented uh, pilot friend of mine, Jim Record, who is with a group, uh, a, a, an, an air show uh, and commercial uh, flight team called the Geico Skytypers. 
And uh, Jim is uh, their narrator, an advanced pilot, and he flies airliners and warbirds. And uh, but he's out there. Good to see him. But uh, and of course, John Byerly, uh, another classmate. Uh, my uh, I don't know that I would ever consider myself a linguist, but I as a as a musician, as a singer, primarily and a guitarist as well. I think the 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 ear you develop uh, of uh, when you're doing musical stuff helps you in how you are able to hear other people's accents. So if it's German, we could talk German, or if we talk to French, oh, <laughs> j'adore. Uh, we got a little French in there, and then there's Middle East. You know, it, it, a lot of different things. But in terms of a an audio book, it's uh, you do hints of it if you can. Um, and now I, I will lean in into the French more because I know how to speak French to some degree, but uh, I I was a I was a high school musician and in the choir uh, and did musical theater did some in in college wound up on television in Cincinnati on a live talk variety show from 1970 to 1983 called the Bob Braun Show and we sang. Heck, I sang everything from John Denver to show tunes to Earth, Wind, and Fire during my 13 years there. Eight-piece band, live studio audience, five days a week, no net, live four stations. And so we were on in Columbus, Dayton, Indianapolis, and Cincinnati. And that <clears throat> experience that I got when do in doing that show, uh, working with a guy named Bob Braun who could ad-lib his way out of anything, he was probably the best ad libber I've ever seen in my life. And there is not a moment that I'm on stage uh, at an air show talking that I'm not acutely aware of the skills that he taught me on how to keep a show going. And I think I attribute my success in a, as an air show announcer now after years as a musician and running an audio business. Uh, I, uh, I attribute that skill to Bob Braun and what I learned doing television. Uh, back then. And so now I'm doing voice work. I'm announcing air shows. Uh, the COVID thing has been an interesting, uh, an interesting challenge, but I've been doing voice work. And when, when I saw Ken's announcement on our high school Facebook page that he said had this book coming out today, I said, I think I typed, Hey, is that, do you have anybody to do the audiobook? Now, I have done one audiobook in my past. It was nonfiction. It was so horrible. It was a real estate thing. I swore I would never do it again. But I still kind of reached out and, and actually swore that I would never do a fiction thing because specifically because of the voice characterizations that have to be handled throughout the, the 390 some pages of, of a book or however long the novel is. But I'm doing it, and it's it is a wonderful challenge. It's a wonderful deal, and I'm so glad that I was able to work things out with Ken and with Bill to uh, to do this. And uh, I believe we're going to move on to the other three books. I think I'm going to be quite busy this summer, uh, working, <laughs> trying to catch up chapter by chapter. Um, especially when you get some Russian, you so you have to have the Russian tech, uh, uh, accent and, and, and pronounce some words that I will doubtless mispronounce during the chapter read tonight. But uh, uh, that's the joy of having, having being able to edit and punch and roll and fix things, but live, no net, what the heck. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a blessed guy uh, who has been able to use I've been able to use my voice throughout my career, and it's and it's uh, no different now as now that I'm a, a Medicare baby at 72 years old and loving every minute of what I'm doing, even through the COVID thing, where I don't get to see Jim because I would see Jim probably eight weekends a year uh, out with a Geico Sky Typers and standing up on stage with him. And I, you know, I said, ladies and gentlemen, now it's time for the Geico Sky Typers, the voice of the uh, Geico Sky Typers, Jim Record, and he would then take over. So anyway, and then John Byerly, you know, the, the singing that he and I did in high school, and he continues to do it in his barbershop quartet. And uh, lots of lots of people out there that 
that I'm 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 thrilled to be uh, thrilled to be working with. And uh, but it's good to see those guys on there as well. So that's that's me. I'm I'm thrilled to do this audiobook. It's a big deal, Red, for me to do it. And I'm I consider myself a working voice actor when I come downstairs and I audition for for commercials and do other things with Sporty's Pilot Shops. I've been working with them for over 30 years as the on-camera host of their pilot training series and helping thousands of people learn to fly around the world. And especially here in this country, and uh, their award, it's an award-winning uh, award uh, education series. So um, I'm, I, I couldn't really be asking for much more. I got an airplane to fly. It's a little, little it's, hey, Red, it's a it's a little teeny Vans RV seven A, experimental, two seats, room for my wife and me, and a hundred pounds of bags, and it's got a stick in it, which is good, right? Right, Red. And Jim Records give me thumbs up too. It's and it's it's all fit, outfitted like an airliner, so I can fly just about any place. I just don't. It's no. It's not a ficky airplane flown into a flight into known icing. Uh, but other than that, as long as I pay attention to weather, I can go any place in it. So anyway, I love my life. except Hawaii. Except Hawaii. I don't think I could get enough gas in it to get from San from uh, from uh, what I think that probably the best place to go from would be Ventura or Santa Barbara to to uh, to uh, uh, the nearest airport Hilo or something like that. That'd be the, the shortest run. But I know guys who have done it, but not in an airplane as small as mine. Why don't you go ahead and give us a live demonstration of what your capabilities are? I understand you pre-decided, uh, pre-selected a chapter for us. I have. Now, here's what we need to do, though, before we do that. I need to turn it back over to Ken to set this up because uh, I'm not starting. I'm going to do chapter three. It's one of the shorter chapters. But uh, Ken, if, if can you give sort of a little setup? It's it's already shown up in the chat that Sharon put up, but but maybe you can set up uh, a little bit of how uh, where we where we end up as uh, as as. Bashir El Kutier, El Kutier comes into uh, and comes into Moscow. Okay, the uh, real quick uh, chapter number one introduces him and and what he has done. He has set up a ambush with three of his buddies from Afghanistan, fellow Mujahideen, and uh, and so they intercept a a Russian convoy in the middle truck of which uh, it was carrying. Uh, fuel rods for uh, uh, nuclear reactors being built. And so the first chapter basically outlines him ambushing this convoy and then taking off and then going to hide. And then the, the second chapter uh, introduces the uh, protagonist, Nick Parkos. And Nick is a low level analyst at the National Security Agency. And this guy is just He's a, a kid that sort of backed into the uh, agency after he graduated with the degree of criminology from Ohio State. And so since, you know, I'm an Ohio guy and <laughs> grew up in Columbus, I have to get a shout out to, to the Buckeyes. But anyway, rate, so, um, so Nick uh, is introduced to the director of national intelligence, who much to Nick's astonishment has picked him because of his brain. Nick is able to arrive, look at all sorts of disparate things and clues and uh, he can set them down and kind of figure out the end point. He's kind of famous for a, writing a Venn diagram. So then the third chapter is uh, when Al Cartier is getting ready, he's heading to Moscow to set off his first bomb. Okay. Chapter three, Moscow, the Russian Federation, Wednesday, 4 November. Bashir settled on the train's wooden bench and extended his left leg to relieve the ache in his thigh. The pain from the old wound was always there, an intruder into his thoughts from that fateful fifth day of February. He slowed his breathing and studied the other passengers. They had boarded with him at the provincial city of Riazan for the three-hour trip to the capital. Most of them fell asleep. The remainder stared out the windows at the passing countryside. None of them looked like FSB, the Russian Federal Security Service, whose presence on the trains had increased following the bombing of the Lubyanka metro station in September. A half smile crossed his face. To be blown up by a suicide bomber would indeed be ironic. He lifted his satchel onto his lap and pulled out a copy of Pravda. 
a photograph of the American president shaking hands with Anatoly Srinvenko, the president of the Russian Federation, dominated the front page. Their eyes lied, their gesture hollow. The nuclear disarmament treaty they had just signed included a provision for the Russians to reprocess another 75 tons of weapons-grade plutonium. The document meant nothing. The two most powerful men in the war on Earth stared at him from the front page. He studied the picture for a moment before dropping the newspaper on the floor. He drove his boot into their faces, grinding them both out of existence. In a few hours, their mighty armies would mean nothing. Bashir hadn't chosen this day at random, but his selection couldn't have been more fortuitous. The prevailing winds during the first week of November would spread death across Red Square in the Kremlin. Better yet, the temperature was an unseasonably warm two degrees Celsius. Holiday crowds were descending on Moscow to celebrate Unity Day. The rhythmic beat of the commuter train's wheels slowed, prompting him to look out of his first frost etched window. Repetitious slabs of worker housing jammed together in a near treeless landscape rolled by. A light snow had fallen during the night, providing some visual relief to the monotonous gray suburbs of Moscow. He checked his iPhone to verify the arrival time and settled back into his seat for the remainder of the trip. The train screeched to a stop at the Kazansky station, one of the three rail stations bordering the Komosaya, Komomas, see, there it is, Komosoma, Komosomayalska Square in northwest, northeast Moscow. Bashir grabbed his satchel and waited for the others to leave the car before stepping into utter mayhem. Hundreds of people pressed toward the exits. His eyes passed over neoclassical crystal chandeliers, turn-of-the-century sculpted ironwork, fluted pylons, and bas-relief yellow-gold ceilings. When he first visited Moscow years before as a teenager, he thought the station beautiful. Now, he looked at the cavernous space with disdain. The murals depicting the glory of the revolution mocked him. He blended in with a crush of humanity and exited the terminal through a pedestrian tunnel. He hesitated at an arched doorway leading to a narrow, narrow alleyway of shuttered kiosks. The smell of vomit and stale urine assailed him. Danger. His right hand ran across the bulk of his coat that concealed the Marakov, a Makarov 9mm pistol. He understood this world, so different from the one he'd known as a student at the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology. He turned left and made his way through the clutter, circumventing uniformed security police intent on disposing the drunks littering the street. He wasn't concerned. He'd seen this act played before many times. The drunks were being dumped in the adjacent alley alleyways to keep them out of sight of the morning commuters. Wrapped in old newspapers and tattered blankets, they had passed out or been beaten unconscious by thugs from the Ismayovskaya gang the night before. The militiamen and private security guards were bent over, their backs to him while searching the derelicts for any money overlooked by those who preyed on the homeless. He hurried past, continuing on to meet the rest of his team at the kiosk they'd rented months before. Bashir made his way down the dark alley, senses alert. The smell of freshly baked bread replaced the stench of human squalor. The aroma prompted him to pause. He crossed the corridor to the bakery, dropped a couple of rubles on the counter for a loaf of black rye bread, and exited the shop. His destination was a few doors down, a flickering, flickering fluorescent light dangling from two rusted chains advertised its wares. Electronics. He stopped and pretended to look through the smudged display window at the haphazard collection of cheap electronic devices, knockoffs of watches, and pirated CDs. The store had opened six months earlier and did little business. He scanned, he scanned the reverse image of the street behind him, but saw nothing to rouse suspicion in the few people sharing the alleyway. None appeared the least interested in him or the store. He turned his head toward Yushiska, who sat on a wrought iron bench guarding the kiosk. Nothing, Yushiska confirmed from behind the newspaper he pretended to read. The others? Inside. Bashir pushed open the door of the cramped shop. Discarded cell phones that had been cannibalized for their parts littered a small workbench. Salim sat behind the clutter, his strength 
and thus his value to Bashir, was his expertise in fabricating remote detonator devices. Salim, oiling the action of an automatic pistol, didn't look up. You won't be needing that, Bashir said. Salim took a long pull on his cheap Russian cigarette and exhaled a plume of acrid smoke. It deters the scum who try to steal from me. He studied the tip of his cigarette and tapped the ash into a red salt rock ashtray he'd picked up in Afghanistan. He replaced the cigarette in the corner of his mouth, opened a drawer in his workbench, removed two cell phones, and handed them to Bashir. Bashir chose one at random and turned it over in his hand before flipping open the cover. Inside the device, Salim had mated a car remote with the cell phone circuitry to create a detonation circuit. Just turn it all and press call. Bashir handed the phones back without comment. Azad sat in the corner wearing a clean white cotton shirt, reading a worn copy of the Koran. He looked reasonably, excuse me, he looked remarkably composed for a man about to die. For his part, Bashir held no desire to seek martyrdom. He had no interest in killing people for God. He was driven by more personal reasons. Bashir pulled out the black bread from his satchel and handed it to Salim. Salim nodded, tore off a hunk, and tossed the rest across the room to Azad. Is the package ready? Azad ripped off a piece from the loaf and stuffed it in his mouth. Over there, in the box. Bashir walked to the corner of the shop. Inside the box were two bandoliers of explosives and a black leather coach day pack. He removed one of the bandoliers. Excellent. The device could easily be concealed under a winter coat. He hefted the day pack by its single sling, judging its weight. It was heavier than he would have wished. He set it on the floor and unzipped the top. Inside the 20 by 50 centimeter compartment nestled a sealed box that once contained a leaded glass decanter. The box now contained two clusters of the four inch high Vipac cylinders they'd taken from the ambush. Packed around the cylinders, were 100 dark gray pellets from the reactor fuel rod. He had purchased the crystal decanter the week before. If someone were to check his bag, he could produce the receipt from the Hrustal and Farfar shop and explain he was returning the decanter. Bashir slipped the backpack over his shoulder. Time to go. End of chapter three. Ah. Thank you, Rob. That's, I tell you, I love it. It was a, you know, it's, it's fun listening to Rob because he, he, he brings the story alive. And, you know, it's interesting because I wrote the darn book. It's <laughs> like looking at it at a, at a complete different perspective. Thank and you. So it's fun. It's been a great collaboration. <laughs> We're having a hoot. We, we certainly are. I mean, we have not seen each other in, since, since we graduated from high school. And Facebook has, has brought a bunch of us back together. And uh, when, 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 as I mentioned, when, when Ken said he had the book coming, I said, this, this could be really fun, getting back together with a high school chum and, and, uh, and doing something like this. It's pretty cool. And, yeah. and again, I have the greatest respect for anybody who has served and uh, to all, all of you who have, thank you very much. And let, it, Red, before we go, what did you fly? You were a naval aviator. You brown shoe, right? P3. Yes, brown shoe, P3s. Ah, wonderful. Anti-submarine warfare, four-engine uh, turboprop, finger tail, Lockheed Electra. You bet. 99-foot wingspan. Were you at Brunswick or Jack's or Whidbey? I was in Barbers Point, Hawaii, uh, Moffett Field, California, and New oh, Orleans. We were, that was at Moffett. Nice. Well, yeah. I, the, I, uh, I have announced in the past the uh, great state of Maine air show, and my wife and I still get up there. And when we fly up, we, we land at the old NAS, which is now uh, Brunswick Executive. And uh, when, we, when we drive off the base, there's a there's a Neptune and a P3 that just this past summer was repainted, and it looks great. Yeah. When I joined the squadron in 1971 in January, they had just finished putting the last airframes changed in to have EPUs put in the aircraft. Doesn't that require the oh my gosh, units? yeah, 
So a long ways was that from early models that were just ridiculous in the way the configurations were, but I ended up with a little over 4,200 hours. Wow, in the that's cool. Home. That's great. Well, Red, I can't let you off Thank really you. easy though. <laughs> it's my, my okay. favorite military cartoons. So they, they have a picture of a P3 and the pilot and co-pilot in the, uh, up in the cockpit and off to the left part of the aircraft is the uh, a snorkel of a submarine breaking the surface. And they're all looking to the right side and the co-pilot says, hey, isn't that a per diem check? Looking on the top of the ocean. It is absolutely, that is absolutely true. <laughs> so anyway, I couldn't help myself. Because of the way, because of the way our orders were cut, we were entitled yeah. to redeem wherever we went. Yeah, yeah. Some area, then we got more money. But uh, regardless, Rob, uh, you do. Let me confirm. You do do audio uh, books for other people. Is that one of the new ventures you're taking on? Yeah, sure do. And I do want to say hello to one other person who chimed in, who checked in with me personally, Bill DeWeese, a guy who was my coach, who who uh, who when I started doing all chasing this voice business uh, more seriously, Bill. Um, Bill and I connected and it's been really a great, uh, great fun to be having him in, in, in Cincinnati now for after living in Chicago. But he said, let the market decide what you're going to do. And so, you know, that's why I thought, man, I've got an opportunity to do something that, that can be functioning on a lot of different levels. Uh, friendship, uh, great, I mean, it's a great story. It's it, as I, as I read it, I am reading one chapter ahead of what I record. So I don't know how this ends yet, but I got to, I'm getting ready to record chapter 26 tonight. And I pre-read it this morning and I sent a note to Ken. I said, are you kidding, Ferguson? <laughs> a new development, a twist in a character. Twists in characters that have me total. I don't know whether one character is a double agent or a triple agent. Would that be fair to say, Ken? Oh, that would be, and it, uh, it finally gets itself sorted out in, in number four. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, then I have to read more. <laughs> right. Literally. <laughs> Let me do this. Uh, I noticed that uh, Sharon has already published, put information in the chat. For those people who don't know how to save the chat, if you go to the very end of the chat, at the bottom right-hand side, there's three dots. You click on those three dots, and one of them is to save the chat. Uh, and... That way you at least be able to record everything without having to copy and paste and put it somewhere in a document. That's the easiest way to do that information. But Rob, while we have a few minutes left, I'm going to go back to Ken to wrap things up. Would you include whatever information you think is, is appropriate for people to get in contact with you if they are interested? RobRiderVoice.com. RobRiderVoice.com. It's got all my contact info. RobRiderVoice.com. Yeah, and right now, Right now, the first thing you see when you go to that website is the trailer for Amber Dawn. Ah, thank you. That's what you see. So, and uh -huh. hey, by the way, Paul Herrera jumped into the chat, went through uh, SEER training at uh, Whidbey in February of 1967 before he went to swift boat duty in Vietnam. Paul Herrera, thanks for your service. And uh, Marcus Griffin, thanks for your nice comments as well. Ken, uh, let's wrap things up here. Uh, we've had a chance to learn a little bit about you, learn a little bit about the, uh, your voice and the, uh, the audio world. And you've had a chance to tell us we've got some more, play, some more books coming down the road and we're really not going to know who's who until book number four, according to uh, the, latest information, the latest intel, so to speak. Uh, we'll give you a minute or two to, let things, uh, to wrap things up and uh, we'll go ahead and, and close the show. All righty. Well, you know, it's, it, you know, the writing is one thing and it's really turned into quite a, an unexpected adventure. But one of the really fun things about this thing is, and, and Rob kind of alluded to it with some of the folks that he uh, said hello to and acknowledged on online. And I really kind of reached out and, and just meeting all sorts of really interesting people. People have done really fun things with their lives, uh, incredible things they did while they were serving. Um, and, and so that's been it. You know, some folks say, well, what kind of audience are you looking for? And, and that's kind of a hard thing to say, but I, it, you know, people looking for a, a good story, uh, 
one of the things I didn't want to do, I, I finally tired of, of reading books with over the top characters that just sort of blasted their way through the pages and wanted to kind of deal a little more you know, and about people. And I think that's what this is all about. So if you, if you close a book, you, 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 most authors will tell you that they really want the, the folks who read the book to really kind of say, boy, that was really a neat person. Or did I learn something? You know, that I go to a different place I've never been before. Um, that even makes a shout out to YouTube. I mean, goodness gracious, when I was doing the chapter on the Goom department store in Red Square, you know, I've never been there. But, you know, you go on YouTube and there's guys walking around with, the, with their video cameras. And so, well, you know, I was there. So when I'm talking about the Colors Cafe, I mean, dang, it was really pretty cool. I'm uh, so impressed. I thought you'd been there, Ken. I thought you said <laughs> so the baby guy goes to Moscow and does no, you know, I haven't been there. I've been to a lot of places in the Pacific, but uh, <laughs> never, never, never to Moscow. But so it's a shout out to YouTube. So I don't know what I would do in writing these things, you know, especially if you're doing kind of any kind of reasonable background. You know, if it wasn't for, you know, being able to go on the Internet and search this stuff down, you'd be lost. I don't know how they, these authors thing with, back that they did it. Same thing with pronunciations, you know, like Komsomoskaya. I, you know, I can say it now. I couldn't say it when I read the chapter. But uh, but I, I and the other thing I found out is when you go to get these <laughs> these pronunciations, some of them aren't even close. They don't even know. It's like it's just I think maybe I should be I had to dig deep. You know, it slows things down a bit. That is fine. Anyway. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. I got, I got another thing. I was going through some of my files and I was actually trying to educate myself. And there was this uh, big thing from Stephen King. And then he kind of I'll have to read it again. I said, don't waste your time. Um, Approach your work as a personal statement. You may not know what that is when you begin, but you may know when you've finished. And uh, so that's, that's pretty cool. I think that's probably true for a lot of folks' lives. You, you start off and you just never know where your life's going to take you. And, uh, but you just got to keep making it an adventure. And that's fun. Yes, indeed. Let me thank Red, uh, Ken for your time, uh, Rob. Uh, especially for your reading tonight and insights into the audio world and for Sharon inviting me to uh, be part of this today. So thank you all very, very much. And I really, truly appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks all. All righty. Thank you. See you around. Good night, night, Red. Well, good night. Yeah. I still got time for a swim here in Hawaii. So ah. <laughs> sorry. I know. <laughs> I had to.